Ray, thanks for having us. And uh, yeah, we showed the mail and Dinesh was like very generous. Um, he, was, he was able to like set it up so that the timing of this meetup coincides with when we are here and we are only here for a week. So thanks and thanks everybody for coming. Um, so Francis gave a talk about dgraph um, and uh, you know, every database needs some level of cache. Um, we were using a cache before um, and it didn't really work out for us for various reasons, which is why we ended up building this thing called Ristretto. So Ristretto is a high performance uh, concurrent memory bound Go cache. And it's, uh, this sort of like all originates from uh, another piece that we had written. Let me see, where is it? Uh, somewhere over here, yeah. This is called the uh, state of caching in Go. And it just talks about like all the different issues that we faced while trying to um, build a highly concurrent cache in Go. The, yeah, the, the problem was that we were using um, group caches, LRU cache, right? And this is written by Brad Fitzpatrick who, who wrote uh, Memcached, right? And part of the core team. And we were using that uh, within dgraph, but the problem was that as the number of go routines increased and we were trying to like really hit it hard, um, things, it, there was a lot of contention and um, our queries started to slow down. And we did not realize this for a long time. Um, but at some point we did. And uh, I remember like doing this commit, we did this change where I just removed the cache and our query latency improved 10 times. It was incredible, right? So Badger was doing a lot better job than we thought it would be doing. So you, know, you couldn't imagine this, but the cache was slowing us down, right? And we were like, this is not good. So let's look around. And we, uh, that's what the blog post is about. We looked around, we looked at uh, big cache, fast cache, uh, and some sync, sync uh, based cache and so on and so forth. Um, and we had like five requirements. It should be concurrent. It should be memory bound. Right, we, we should be able to evict entries once the cache's memory gets filled up. Um, it should scale well as the number of accesses, concurrent accesses increase, so the number of cores, the number of go routines, and it should also scale well if you access the same keys over and over again. So a typical zip VN distribution says that um, certain number of keys get accessed exponentially more times than others, so it's sort of like an inverse exponential graph. Um, and it should scale well for those. And finally, it should still have a high hit ratio because if you're missing a lot, your cache actually slows you down, right? Um, we looked around and, you know, as I said, the blog post talked about all those things. We couldn't find anything which works. Um, so we looked outside of Go language and we found this uh, cache called Caffeine, written by a guy called Ben Mains, who wrote multiple papers about the cache. The cache was actually used by Cassandra. It's being used by Neo4j. It's being used by HBase. It's really one of the best caches available in Java land, right? Which is always the case, right? Go lacks a lot of libraries. We always find better libraries in other languages. For example, DocsDB is in C++. We couldn't use it, so we ended up writing Badger. In this case, Caffeine was in Java. We couldn't use, well, of course, we can't use Java. So we ended up writing uh, Ristretto. What is Ristretto? How many people drink Ristretto? How many people drink coffee? Two people, actually more. <laughs> um, so Ristretto is a, is a short, short of espresso. It's like half the size of espresso. Um, but um, uh, it, it contains the sweeter part of the espresso. So you can just put some milk in it and it's good to go. I like it. Um, also, Ristretto is a highly performant, concurrent memory bound Go cache. It, it, it matches all the five things we're looking for, which is it gives a high hit ratio, gives a high read write throughput, it scales really well as the number of cores increase, and it is contention proof, which is a big claim, right? but it, it literally is, is saving against contentious um, settings. So even if you access it a lot, 
with multiple goroutines running at the same time, it would not slow you down. So just to give you a sense for how the cache looks, this is how you would uh, um, you know, create it. Say so the standard union cache, num counters, max cost, and buffer items. And it might make no sense, like what are these settings? Um, max cost is basically telling what is the maximum cost the cache could have before it needs to evict things out of the cache to make space, right? And uh, the good thing about Ristrado is that it does not assume what the cost is per key. For example, in a lot of LRU caches, uh, each key costs one, which is generally not how things are done. Like some values could be really big. And if you put in them in the cache, the cache's memory usage is really high. So, but it was we actually have a cost associated with each key, right? And so you can specify the words of max cost that the whole cache should have, right? Um, so you create this thing, num counters um, is a way to keep track of the frequency at which we have seen the keys. So how many keys frequency can we track? That is set by num counters. Um, and some of the techniques that we're using, um, it makes it extremely efficient for us to keep track of the frequency of keys that we have seen. And by seen, I mean, if, we, if some key did a get, or if some key had a set, that means we have seen. And if they have five gets, the counter should be five, right, roughly. Um, <clears throat> then we have cache.set, which is the key, the value, and the cost. The cost in this case is one, right? Um, we sleep a bit now. This is, this, this, gets, this is something we'll discuss like as we go through the slides. Then you do a cache or get, and hopefully you get the value. You found it, didn't find panic, and then you can also delete a key from the cache. So it's a cache, right? I mean, ultimately it's very simple. Set, get, and delete. That's it. Any questions so far? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so I'll discuss like the mechanisms that we had to use to build this cache. So I won't go too much into why we build the cache. We already have a blog post about that. Um, I'll discuss like what makes this cache so interesting, right? So the first thing that we did was we found an interesting way to use runtime functions. Um, Go team has this thing they call memhash, which uses assembly instructions to get a hash of a string or a um, byte array or, or something. So what we did was we, don't, we didn't want to pay the cost of having to keep the key. The key could be really long, right? Could be 64 bytes, 128 bytes, 362 bytes, who knows, right? I mean, um, so we didn't want to like pay the cost. So we just took a hash of the key and we made that the basis for storage. Right? Now, somebody could argue, hmm, there would be um, collisions. There could be collisions. That's true. Right now, the cache doesn't handle that. It's a to-do for us to detect those and uh, deal with that. But um, instead of using any existing hash functions, there is farm.fingerprint64, which we use in dgraph. There are others. Um, we uh, hooked into Go's memcache, uh, memhash, and uh, that gives us a hash in like five nanoseconds or something. It's really fast. Um, the cache itself, the storage part of the cache, we tried various things. We, we used a uh, logged sync mutex and just the whole cache, which is hash map, go hash map, right? Um, there was one that we tried. We used sync.map. There's a second one that we tried. And for a long time, we felt that that must be the most efficient. Um, but uh, once everything was done, we started looking and realized that that's not the most, in fact, single map is actually pretty slow. Um, so we did a sharded map where we had 256 shards. Each shard has a uh, lock and then it has a normal go map, right? And the way we decide the shard. Now, if we were in some other, uh, let's say, programming language, we would know which thread is actually dealing with the access. So we can do thread local, right? In Go, that doesn't exist because Go team would not expose that to you. So what we did was we had the hash, uh, this hash, which was cheaper, right? So we took that hash and we determined the shard 
based upon this hash, right? We already have this information, we can reuse it. <clears throat> so what do we do for concurrency? Mechanism number three, there's a paper called BP wrapper. Um, what it basically says is that for excesses which would hit critical paths, which require serialization, blocking, et cetera, instead of hitting it every time, every invocation, you batch them up, batch up these operations, and then you acquire the lock once, you do those things, and then you release the lock. So you decrease the number of times the lock is acquired and released. In fact, the way they suggest doing it is to fill up a ring buffer. Once it's filled up, do the critical section together for all of those accesses or keys or whatever, like drain it into the critical section, then remove. And it makes every, almost they say, every algorithm really fast. So we use that pretty heavily, right? We use it for both our gets and our sets. The question then became, how do we build these ring buffers? What's the best way to build them? So we tried many things, right? Um, the gets based upon the paper for caffeine. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. So what I understood, you write into the case in a batch mode. So it will not uh, hamper the availability of uh, redo operation, which are there in the ring buffer. Um, yeah. So um, I was going to get to it, but I can get to it right now. Um, what will happen is if you do some get, initially it will go to a ring buffer, which means it's not applied to the cache itself, uh, which means the frequency tracking that we're doing for that key would not be updated yet, right? Um, but generally that's okay. We haven't seen that uh, affecting our hit ratios too much, right? However, in sets, um, if you notice we were, yep, we were doing a timed sleep here, right? Uh, it's because we, there is a mechanism going on there, which is, which is the moment the set returns, the set might not be done yet. It's actually gets done in the background. Um, so the sets would be slightly delayed. So, um, so all gets are put into a lossy buffer, right? So the question was for us was uh, how do we build this lossy buffer? Again, like in Java or other language C++, you might know thread local. So you just put that in thread local uh, buffer that you have. You don't have to acquire any locks. Things are really fast, but in Go, you don't have that. So what do you do? Other mechanism was to explore using channels. We tried using channels. Channels was uh, no less fast, right? Um, and then there was a, a bug that we found. Somebody was like complaining to go to him saying, hey, why don't you expose the, the threads? Um, and uh, when they were actually using it themselves in sync.pool. Um, so that he was like, hmm, sync.pool actually uses threads internally. Maybe we can use sync.pool. So what we did was we did this simple thing. Uh, we create these stripes, right? We put the stripe using, we get it from pool.get. So it gives us the stripe. We push the key into the stripe and we put the stripe back into the pool. We don't have to acquire any more locks because once you get it, you, only you have access to it. No locking required and then put it back. Now think about sync.pool if you understand is that um, if there is too many ring stripes, or objects in sync.pool, when GC runs, it's going to remove some of them, right? So that's the first level of lossy, right? Because GC might be able to remove some entries from sync.pool itself. Um, and the second level of lossy, which I think is the next slide. Um, but basically, sync.pool performed way better because it internally had access to thread local. Yeah, it's a pretty unique way of single pool. I did not think about it. One of the guys working on the team, he figured it out. Um, so, so gets are processed with a delay, right? Only when the stripe reaches its capacity, right? Um, and um, um, so what happens is, you know, we, we go to stripe from the single pool right here, right? And after that, there is a thing which says, oh, is the stripe capacity reached? In which case, flush it out. 
And uh, the way it flushes it out is that it pushes it into a channel then, items ch, right? Push it into channel. Now, if there's too many pending writes, uh, I think the items channel has capacity of three, so it will just go to default and just get dropped. So we are okay dropping a bunch of gets to make sure that the cache internally doesn't get overwhelmed, hence causing slowness to your operations, right? Um, so mm, the cache capacity reached, the keys are pushed into admission policy. If there's too many pending, push will be dropped. That's lossy behavior too, right? We got all the losses. And then internally, what happens is with the push for each key, the increment. You don't need to worry about what increment does right now. We'll get to that later. Yeah. So the big picture is not clear. Is this a client side cache? Is this right through, right back? Is it only per process? Um, it is uh, generally per process. Yeah, but you could you could have as many instances of this cache running around. Yeah. Right through, right. Back. Um, I'm not sure what right through right back means. It's, it's, uh, every every put does it get get uh, percolated to the back end? Some some you know you have. Oh, um, uh, it's not persistent cache. It's just a just a cache. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so mechanism number five, we also had to make sure that the sets don't overwhelm the system, which means that sets are put into another lossy buffer, right? Uh, and for sets, we for gets, we what we do is we have a ring buffer, we add the element to the ring buffer, then we fill it up. Once it gets filled up, then we apply it, right? But sets, we didn't want to wait that long. We didn't want to fill up like 128 sets and then apply them because like user would complain, hey, what's happening? Even if there's no contention, it takes forever. That's not right. So what we had to do was we we had to use channels in this case. Um, so what we do is once the site comes, we create an item out of it, which has the key, the value, and the cost, as we had seen before, puts it into the buffer. If the buffer is already full, just drops it, right? So it would drop sets. But the, the good thing is that um, we have this channel. This channel is constant, consistently being processed by another go routine, which is applying these sets, yeah. Aren't you keeping the CPU busy in this cycle? It's not a cycle. It's just a, it's not a for loop. Okay. It's just a one select. So it will return uh, drop sets and false. So. so if you are dropping every time, so next time request comes and then it's get executed to default, right? Only if set buff is full, okay. right? If set buff is not full, it will push to set buff. Yeah. Thanks. And actually, you do want it to drop if it's already pretty full because, again, like you don't want your gets and sets to slow down your application, which is one of the things that I mentioned. It's contention proof. It really meant that when the cache is like operating at capacity, we just start dropping stuff, right? And the cache takes care of that. Um, so, yeah, as I mentioned, so both gets and sets would drop items if too many are pending, right? This performs really well under contention. We tried it with so many go routines and like so many loops and stuff. Um, the hit ratio obviously gets slightly affected, right? If you're dropping a lot of gets and sets, hit ratio is affected, but we realized that it was still much better than all the other alternatives, um, which we tried, which is big cache and uh, fast cache and so on and so forth. Um, so it degrades, but it degrades like slightly. Um, it does mean that sets can be lost or rejected. Um, so that's something your application would need to be aware of, right? Uh, it's not consistent in that way. So just because you did a set doesn't mean it would be there. You might have to do, if you do a get, you might not find it. But the idea is that then you can do another set later if you really need to. A uh, lot of cases, you do a set and the key is never accessed. Then again, yeah, like it basically like set is not is not a given, right? Now it does cause a problem where you already the cache already had that key, right? And let's say set was dropped, then you now have a old value for a key which already exists in the cache, 
And for that, we'll have a separate mechanism. So if the key already exists, we just update it. Yeah, that way you don't get a stale value for a key which already exists. Hi, uh, so I have a question uh, regarding the thinking that was going on while designing. Um, and w what sort of factors affected uh, your design choices? So with regard to lossy behavior, for example, so uh, at one place, lossy behavior point number two, uh, the channel only accepts uh, three items. And if, if, if it's more than that, then you just drop it, right? And uh, uh, the lossy behavior can affect your uh, cash hit ratio, like you mentioned before. So uh, all these design design decisions, was it, a, uh, was it an iterative process? Uh, uh, what, what was yeah. the thinking behind these? We, um, so by the way, this, this items CH, it's not three items, it's like three slices of keys. And so the key is the size of the ring buffer, which, which is, I think, set to, um, initially we set it to 64 or something, let me see. Uh, buffer items, so it's like you can configure these things, right? Um, so it's 64. Um, but the way we decided to build this thing, we looked at the papers, right? So we looked at uh, caffeine. The um, author Ben Mains had written a paper about caffeine itself, also written blog posts about it. We looked at uh, the BB wrapper paper. So we had like a list of like four or five papers that we followed to be able to build this thing. And caffeine itself um, had the whole concept of low C ring buffers and so on and so forth. So the biggest thing for us is to was to figure out how best we can implement that in Go, right? Because in, in Java, they had the benefits of thread local storage. They even had a um, sort of a concurrent hash map, which doesn't require any locks at all. Right, so they could just have one map for everything, but in Go we don't have that. So we had to use a sharded thingy, or we tried sync map and so on and so forth. So the biggest thing was what parts we take uh, from those papers and from implementation, and how do we get it in Go to perform really well. Um, other things in Java that they had was they had a LRU based cache, and we decided that uh, LRU was a bit of an overkill. In fact, it would be slower and we built it based upon LFU. So LRU is least recently recently used, right? And LFU is least frequently used. And so any LFU, which I was mentioning about, uh, which keeps track of keys to counters, which is the frequency of access, we use that information to figure out what to evict and admit. But we'll get to that. Uh, in the set, we are adding it to the buffers, right? Um, once we get a get, like, uh, do we need to check in the buffers as well? If you do a get um, in Ristrato, um, we will check in the cache if it's there or not first, right? And uh, then we'll capture it through the ring buffer mechanism. Um, so it might not be there in the cache yet. Is that the question? Yeah, I mean, when you do your set, it goes into the buffers first, mm -hmm. not into the cache yet. No. On, 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 when you're doing the get on it, mm -hmm. um, maybe it might be a miss. It, it might be Even a miss. after doing a set, it might be a miss. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one mechanism you mentioned about uh, stale values will definitely be updated. So just before setting, you if in you are you doing get and in case you are doing get, if it fails, uh, like will it affect the performance? Um, so the mechanism that uh, that we are adding is a to do it should be one line change. Uh, would basically do a update if present, basically right. So when you call the set, it will quickly check the cache, the map, the right chart of it, and if the key already exists there, it will update it and just return. In which case, it does not need to put it in the set buffer, set buffer, right, because it's already done. Um, so that ways we can make sure that uh, if the key already exists, we can deal with it. But we don't do a separate get per se. We, you know, yeah. Okay. Um, the, one of the thing, annoying thing that I found about other caches was like they were all assuming that the key value costs one. Right. It just makes no sense. Um, including almost all the LRU 
uh, implementations I've seen, they would just do it based upon number of elements, which is a lot simpler implementation because for every key you add, you remove one key, so the costs are fixed, right? But that's just not how things work in practice. You might add a value which is a like a kilobyte and other values which are all like 32 bytes. So if you add a kilobyte, you might have to remove like hundreds of 32 byte key values to make the same, to utilize the same space, right? Um, and so we want to make sure that this is built in a way where we understand all that, right? And we do the right mechanisms for it. So each key value um, has a distinct cost and the cost is set using the set, right? So key, well, and the cost, you can specify it. Um, internally, it maintains a key to cost map, which is uh, separate. Now this is not the frequency map, which is different, right? Because the frequency map's job is to capture all the keys in the ecosystem or as, as many as you can. This is just the keys which are in the cache, right? Uh, which, are, which have the value and so on and so forth. So it maintains a key to cost and the total capacity of the cache is based on this cost. So you can, when you said max capacity, um, the cost is counted against that max capacity. Um, it can be, I think for example in Badger, we could set it to the bytes, byte length for key and value, but actually the key is UN64, so the length of the value. Um, or if you so desire, you can still set it to one for just keeping the number of elements. So now this is the tricky part about the start of the policy, right? This is where a lot of research uh, that we used uh, was done. Um, typical caches don't have an admission policy. If you do LRU, everything that gets uh, set would be admitted, right? It would get put and then later they will figure out the, the oldest one and remove that and that's that, right? There's no admission policy. But if you really want to improve the hit ratios, you must be smarter than that. You have to figure out, does, is it worth to add this key to the cache or not, right? Because a lot of times what happens is you see the key only once and you never see them again, but it adds like computational resources, it costs and it, it will probably evict something which has a higher chance of getting accessed again. And so it will affect your hit ratios. So there is two things that we do here to um, deal with that. The first one is to use a Bloom filter. So we have the, you know, the hash UN64, so we don't have to calculate it again. Uh, we use that and we try to see if um, this key has been seen before or not. If it's the first time we are seeing it, that means the key was not present in the Bloom filter. We add it, but we don't do anything more. We stop right there, right? Um, we don't add it to the next mechanism. Um, and if it, was, if it was present, then we go to the next, the next level. So think of it as like layered approach, right? The first is the doorkeeper just says, hey, have I seen you before or not? If I have, pass through. If I have not, stop right there. I have registered you. So if you come back again, I will let you pass through, but not this time. People know Bloom filters, right? Yeah, 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 one guy. Uh, pretty sure more people know. But if somebody doesn't know, Bloom filter is basically, a, think of it as like a simple test, which will tell you if something is definitely absent, but wouldn't be sure if it's present or not. Does it make sense? Yeah. Tell you if it's definitely absent. All right. Mechanism number eight, um, tiny LFU. And that's where a lot of the, the research by Ben Mains was done. Um, so tiny LFU in, uh, let's say, if you had infinite memory, right? For every key access, you will be able to store the frequency of access, right? Infinite memory. Um, and if you had that information, you would then be able to build a very highly effective cache because you know, for every key which comes, you see hmm, this was only accessed five times, but all the keys that I have were accessed at least 10 times, right? So I can reject this one. I don't need to add it to my cache. If you are at capacity, if you're not at capacity, you just add, right? Yeah. But 
it all becomes more interesting when you add capacity. Um, now there is a cost to keeping a counter, right? So let's say if you use a int 32 counter or int, uh, I think ints are typically int 32s, right? In uh, 64, do you know? In Go, if you have an int, is it int 32 or int 64? Depends on the argument, but I think everybody has AMD, right? 64. So every 64 then 64, I guess, right? I guess, yeah. Uh, anyways, uh, even if you were to use, let's say, int, then every key would use 64 uh, bits, eight bytes, right? So if you need to then have uh, a thousand of them using uh, eight kilobytes, a million of them uses eight megabytes, a billion of them uses eight gigabytes, which is quite a lot, right? Um, so Tani LFU, what it does is that it only uses four bits for each uh, key, which means if you have a billion keys, it would use 512 megabytes as opposed to eight gigabytes, which is pretty efficient, right? Um, and it does that in a sort of like a interestingly complex way by using three different um, sort of, uh, uh, it will kind of create a key and have three different like hashes come out of it and it'll update each and every one of them to, to figure out what's the, what's the counter and uh, it will pick the minimum of them to find the estimate of that key, the frequency of uh, that key. Uh, but I won't go into that. There's a talk on its own. Um, but basically we have a smart way uh, which can be extremely cheap about keeping track of the frequency of the keys access, right? That's Tiny LFU. And on top of that, you don't want that a key which was accessed, let's say two days ago, it's still consuming space, right? Um, so you want to have some level of recency. And how do you do that? What you do is that um, we would reset this uh, at Tiny LFU. We by slashing all the counters uh, by half for every n accesses. Right? So after every n keys we have seen, we will just say whatever the counter values is for everybody divided by half. Right? That means we have some recency. Um, and and if you think about some key which was seen two days ago and never seen again, it would go to zero pretty pretty quickly. Right? Um, so then there is recency like that, right? <clears throat> and then this increment, right? How does this Daniel if you increment key? So as I said, like the first thing to do is use the bloom filter. So if it checks add, if not has, if it does not have it, add it to the bloom filter, right? And if it was um, uh, not added, then, uh, um, which means it was already there, then we increment the, um, the freq is a tiny LFU. Then we increment in tiny LFU. So basically like the bloom filter is right here, tiny LFU is right here. Uh, try to first add to bloom filter. If you were able to add to it, then skip. If you were, if it was already there, pass through to the tiny LFU and increment to tiny LFU, right? even though it seems a bit weird, right? We should change the code to make it a bit more clear. Um, but, um, but that's what happens, right? First Bloom filter, then Daniel FU. And then if the number of times, like increments that we have seen, you know, are greater than reset at, then we reset, which is divided by half, um, all the counters. So that's Daniel LFU. Um, and uh, I think one thing here is, the, our admission and eviction is kind of the same mechanism, right? So what we're doing is for all the incoming keys, the gets or sets, we are updating the estimate. The estimate is, um, if you look here, yeah. So this, this mechanism gives us increment, which is what we just saw, and gives an estimate, which is the estimate of the frequency, right? And the reset, which is divided by half, right? Um, so just one interesting thing, right? The estimate, uh, if it's something is in Bloom filter, but not in tiny LFU, the estimate would be one, right? Because Bloom filter would also count. Yeah. But we 
we always increment irrespective of whether we add something to the cache or not. We increment every time we seed some, something. We can reject them later, but we'll still increment them. All right. So, um, so all incoming keys update the estimate. And uh, what we now want to do in a perfect world is that for every incoming key, we want to evict the key with the minimum estimate which is the minimum frequency um, key, but it is hard, right? We'd have to keep like a min heap or something um, and it, it's expensive and the more keys you have, the slower things would get because even if you take a min heap, it's still logarithmic, right? So what we do instead is go maps, uh, iterate the keys randomly, uh, sort of like a feature. Of course, right? Um, it's uh, at least we use it as a feature. Uh, so what we do is we we pick up like five keys from the the cost map, the the key to cost. I don't actually remember that um, because we actually have the the storage, which is the key to value in sharded map, right? Uh, but then we have the actual cost, the key to cost, just in normal map because that didn't need to be access so frequently so anyways so let me generate the list of sample keys we just iterate we get five keys they become our samples and then what we do is that we find the minimum estimate for those five keys by getting their estimates right uh, so if you remember estimate is a frequency of access right so for those five we will check hey what's the what's your estimate what's your estimate and we get five estimates we pick the minimum of them, and then we compare the estimate of the minimum uh, key, which would be the evicted key in, in case, right? Um, is its estimate less than the estimate of the incoming key? Right? So the incoming key, uh, the frequency of access the incoming key has seen, is that higher than what we're going to evict, right? It should be higher. If it's lower, you should not uh, admit it. There's no point adding something whose frequency of access is so low. Right. So, so what we'll do is um, the evicted keys estimate is lower than incoming key, then we'll add the incoming key. Otherwise, we we'll reject the incoming key. So that's admission, right? And also eviction. But here's the actual algorithm, right? So the incoming key, we do the estimate. Can you guys see this in the back and stuff? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so we get the hits, we call it hits, of the, uh, the estimate of the incoming key, right? That's ink estimate. And this room left is just like, how much room does the cache have, which is based upon the max capacity, right? Um, if it is, only if it is less than zero, we'll do this. If we have more room, then we don't need to do any of this, we just add and continue, right? I mean, if your cache is empty, might as well fill it, right? Um, so anyway, so if the, there's no room left, then we'll continue, we'll get the sample. We find the, the minimum key, the minimum hits for that key, which is the estimates, right? And if the incoming uh, estimate is lower than the minimum estimate, we will reject it. And if it is not, then we will delete the minimum key and we will remove it from the sample and we'll uh, fill up uh, the sample again until the capacity that we have is again below the um, max, right? And we'll continue to do this. So basically what could happen is, um, let's say some big value comes, a kilobyte, and we have uh, 256 byte values inside. So we'll go through this three, four times, right? So we'll go first time, let's say we found something which was uh, 256 bytes, we evict them, the cost now, you know, the gap decreases to 726 bytes. We go again, we find something, we evict them, now their gap is 512 bytes. We go again, and this time, actually the, the min hits is actually greater uh, than the incoming, in which case we will then go ahead and reject it anyways. So we will have two evictions, but we will still not add the incoming because we couldn't find uh, something with a estimate lower than what we were admitting.
Hey, uh, so you are actually evicting some of the things without even adding more things to the cache. Yeah. Um, it's just simplicity of the code. We decided it was better to just do it because we are also looking at the room left and stuff, and all of that mechanism works when you delete something. So we didn't want to like complicate that. So yes, we might end up evicting a bunch of stuff and then still not add the new thing. Yeah, but the cache gets used. So just uh, intuition wise. Oh, there's a lot of benchmarks here. Yeah, yeah. When you want to build a really fast, concurrent, high performance, and if you don't do a benchmark, you know, that's just bad, right? The room left is just the. You are checking for that, right? That mm -hmm. condition. So yeah. you, you, when you say if inc inc increment it is less than minimum it's right? So I mean, what made you to I mean uh, uh, have eviction at there as well? I mean, so at particular that uh, logic, right? I mean, what kind of benchmark or is it backed by some benchmark or? I mean, this is just logic, right? This is like just doing what. Uh, what it should be doing, which is that it should be finding the the key with the minimum estimate and evicting that to make space for the incoming key. What? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's general benchmarks about performance of the cache, and uh, the other question was like, should we even delete a key without making sure that the new one can come in, right? But that's just about core simplicity, um, and we didn't think it should affect things too much, anyways. So yeah, that's that. Uh, when does the eviction policy come into place? Uh, once we reach capacity, right? So, um, you know, like the gets are coming, sets are coming, gets going to ring buffer, sets going to this thing. And when the set is running in a loop in a go routine, right? Uh, when we are setting, that's when we check uh, whether it should be admitted. And if it is being admitted, something should be evicted or not, right? So for every admittance, there might be an eviction. Or might be multiple evictions depending upon the cost. Yeah. So my question now is, uh, when the cache gets filled, or here, uh, does the eviction policy keep getting called now for each set that is being set because mm -hmm. it's full? Yeah. Is there likely. no mechanism where you kind of clean up a little bit because you don't want to go through this loop each time? This is happening in the background, right? It's not happening in critical path. Critical path is like just pushing the set into a channel, yeah. and then there's a go routine which is running this critical path in like background. So you don't really care how fast this works. If it is slow, right, then the channel would get filled up and then all the other sets would get thrown away. So your application is not slowed down, right, so. So about recency, so how frequently it goes? Is it a kind of configurable or uh, I mean? Uh, how frequently it goes where? I mean, for recency. Mm -hmm. So you perform some recency where you do half of the yeah. uh, frequency, right? I mean, uh, it's all configurable. Yeah, you can configure like how how often do you want to uh, do the halving? Yeah. yeah. Uh, regarding the range using for randomness, I think usually when we run any small programs or test programs, um, if I have the keys added in one, two, three, four, five, if I run it, I may get in random order. But if I run one more time, the same random order comes. I mean, it's not really random for every run. I think probably here you may be finding it because the map is very huge and you may be changing it regularly. There's some sets going in different routines. I'm just assuming that. It is a small oh, I, program which I had. Mm -hmm. It comes in random one time, but it just repeats. Yeah. Uh, I did not know that. Um, Seems strange, right? I mean, why would it maintain a consistent uh, order? Okay, maybe yeah. I, I tried playground. I mean, go playground. Maybe yeah, I may be wrong also. I mean, go team wouldn't want that anyways because the whole point of adding randomness was to make sure that people don't depend upon the ordering. The moment you start giving back the same ordering, people start depending upon it. So it would like violate their own guidelines. So I I, I mean I don't know, but I don't think that should be the case. Yeah.
yeah, uh, I guess it's worth. But the thing is, like, if we were evicting something, we must be adding something as well, right? I mean, so then it should probably work out. Yeah. So, uh, small question. So, you might have found multiple evictions, but then there is a lot of room left, and then you just add everything. So, you had a mechanism to keep track of evicted things, but then admitted whatever came. So, oh, actually, like, um, we are only evicting as much as we need, right? So, <laughs> Uh, the cost is the cost of the incoming, mm -hmm. so we keep we track. So I mean, if the we would only evict as much as needed to admit this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so if this thing does get admitted, then ultimately the cost would be very close to max. Okay. So in the case it gets admitted, it's fine. Yeah. But in the case it ultimately gets rejected, yeah. there will be a ton of room left, uh -huh. and then whatever comes in next will just kind of should be able to depending upon their cost. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, well, so the mechanisms are all explained. Uh, looks like you guys are all like you guys understand this riddle. Uh, let's do the throughput benchmarks, right? So we ran using cache bench written by uh, Aman. Aman is around. Um, I think Aman had given a talk about the previous blog post that we had written about state of caching in Go. So, so he has really nice benchmarks that we used. We ran them on a i7 machine, 3.7 gigahertz, six cores, 16 gigabyte RAM. Um, then the second thing was we had to run hit ratio benchmarks. And hit ratio benchmarks we, we ran using Damian Girsky's uh, um, uh, benchmarking uh, repository. Right, so we use some from our cache test, which is inside the driver itself, and some from uh, Damian's uh, repository. Um, and in the hit ratios, we actually used like different kinds of um, uh, workloads, and so we look at that. And to figure out if the hit ratio is good or not, we had to build an optimum hit ratio uh, policy. Right, and an optimum hit ratio policy, uh, theoretically optimum, is uh, it basically predicts the future because what it does is that it would keep track of whatever you have accessed, and then it will try to figure out what is after you have accessed everything, reach the end, then it would start to use that information from the future to predict how best it can service requests. Um, so it's not something you can build and use but it is very good to figure out what is theoretically possible and how close you get to it that's what they use for linux uh, page uh, replacement algorithm to like figure out how well it's performing okay the results are here now can i get to it Let's see. there it is all right this is Ristrato's, um Read me, right? So uh, looking at the the hit ratios, right? The first one is for search, the disk read accesses initiated by a large commercial search engine in response to various web search requests. And we have Ristrato, Big Cache, Free Cache, Fast Cache, Goboro, Group Cache, and then the optimal is this gray line, right? So Ristrato comes pretty close to optimal, stays pretty close there. And then the next one is Goboro, but then the Big Cache, and free catch and others sort of like kind of pale, right? So in this case, we go all the way up to like 70, 65%. Um, so 70 or 65, we get pretty close to optimal. That's for search. Um, then there's a database uh, hit ratios workload. So database server running at a commercial site, etc. And again, the optimal is over here. And this title is somewhere over here. And the thing go borrow is kind of like close to this right? But I think Gober is also really slow because um, otherwise we would have just used it. Uh, and the others are like not so great. Okay. Then there is some sort of a looping access. Uh, I think in this case, we could not use the uh, big cache and fast cache because they have a minimum requirement of how much memory they have to use. And some of these uh, required that the memory should be really small. Um, and so we could not run those benchmarks. Um, they would have just shown up as 100% because 
the memory that we had to have and what they use is like they use much much harder so we remove them similarly for code of sale this is Jato, goboro and group cash uh we looks like we slightly paled here all right and then comes the throughput right this is the fun stuff um if we look at state of caching in go um let me see right over here yeah that's the one so for read only we have write only and then we have mixed um the maximum we could get to this is big cash free cash and group cash i was like 45 million operations per second at like 32 cores 32 equities uh, go routines something right 45 and with Ristrato, um for reads we are getting to they're quickly getting to like 55 to 60 and above 60 as we go higher right and the throughput is is much higher than everything else so i think big cash is here fast cash is here so that's all fun. And uh, for the mixed one, we again, like we kind of like reach our ultimate um, sort of number pretty quickly. And then we sort of somewhere in that, in that range, right? And everything else, this is the number of go routines, by the way, I should have mentioned. This is the number of go routines. This is the throughput, the how many operations can you do per second. And so the higher, the better. And then we have the right, um, which is similar. Right, so so um, the shadow quickly goes above and then stays above everybody else in terms of uh, right throughput. All right, and we are hiring in Bangalore. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> <laughs>